Or maybe you had a big dinner last night. Or maybe you're thinking, what's up with this guy? He's always talking about food. He talked about fasting last Sunday night. Now he's asking if we're full. Well, I want you to think about that question. Are you full? You know, we are so blessed as people, aren't we? That we can enjoy big dinners and we can enjoy a big breakfast, basically, whenever we, whenever we want to. But I want you to imagine for a moment going to bed tonight with no food in your refrigerator and no food in your pantry. And I want you to imagine for a moment having to wake up and trying to figure out what are you going to do with the kids and how are you going to feed them with nothing in the house. And as you laid your children down and then maybe collapsed on your bed exhausted and tired, would you have a lot of doubts? Would you have a lot of thoughts? How would you be feeling at that moment? Would you be nervous? Would you be anxious? Would you be upset even with God? I ask you guys to imagine that, but there are many people throughout the world who don't have to imagine that. In fact, there are many people that you have supported overseas in Africa. Because of your uh, giving and because of your generosity, you have given them an opportunity to be able to eat something in the evening time and to eat something in the morning time that they did not have. And unfortunately, there are many people who have to go through this every single day. And we could say that there are people even in America while we have so much wealth in this country, there are many people who are going to bed trying to figure out, what am I going to eat the next day? Now, I want you to imagine another scenario. I want you to think about going to bed each night with no food in the house, but you didn't have to worry about where you're going to eat the next day. You don't have any food in the house. Every day, you go to bed, but you don't have to worry about where you're going to eat the next day. Now, somebody may be thinking, well, how could that be? Well, there's actually an example in the Old Testament of an entire nation who experienced that very thing, where they would go to bed every night with, for 40 years with no food in, that, in their dwelling places, and yet in the morning time, they wouldn't have to worry about what they would eat. You know what I'm talking about? I'm talking about the, the case of, of manna that we read about in the Old Testament. If you have your Bible, open it up to Exodus chapter 16. Uh, this is such an uh, amazing story that I want us to consider for a few minutes this morning. We find the Israelites in the wilderness as a result of not trusting in their God. God had done many mighty miracles. They saw the plagues of God in Israel, or I'm sorry, in Egypt, and they saw God parting the Red Sea and how, they, uh, how God was delivering them. And it period of time, they would find themselves in a bit of a they were in the wilderness, and they would, have, they would have some challenges along the way, and they would not fully trust what God told them and what God wanted from them, and so they would learn to trust in God in an unlikely way. And the story of manna in Exodus chapter 16, it's an amazing story, one that should cause us to give thanks to God, one that should cause us to trust in God even more. And, and one that should cause us to really appreciate the blessings that our Savior, Jesus Christ, has given to us. There's great application for us as well. While this was a story uh, about the Israelites and what God provided for an entire nation, there's great application for you and for me. And I want to talk only for a few minutes about this idea of manna. When we look at the story, we find in Exodus chapter 16, details concerning what God did for his people. God had blessed them, as I already mentioned, how he had delivered them out of bondage, and they saw his power, they saw what he could do, and yet what we find is something that the Israelites often, they were complaining, they were grumbling, they were upset with God. In Exodus chapter 16 and verse 1, the Bible says, then they set out from Elam, and all the congregation of the sons of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after their departure from the land of Egypt. The whole congregation of the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in, in the wilderness. The sons of Israel said to them, Would that we had died by the Lord's hand in the land of Egypt. Isn't that odd? Because that's what they had been complaining to God for so many years. That, God, I want you to deliver us. We need to be delivered from this captivity. And now, after a short amount of time had passed, they said in verse 3, Would that we had died by the Lord's hand in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the pots of meat, when we ate bread to the full, for you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. How quickly their mindsets changed. 
They now were worrying about, we're not going to be able to eat anything. We're going to miss all on all the, the, the meat and the onions and the leeks and the greens and all that that we had in Egypt. God, why are you doing this to us? Despite their grumbling, despite their complaining, I want you to see what God did. The Lord said to Moses, and this is amazing. Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you. Just think about that for a moment. I'm going to rain bread from heaven for you. And the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day, that I may test them whether or not they will walk in my instruction. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. So Moses and Aaron said to all the sons of Israel, at evening you will know that the Lord has brought you out of the land of Egypt, and in the morning you will see the glory of the Lord, for he hears your grumblings against the Lord. And what are we that you grumble against us? Moses said, this will happen when the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening and bread to the full in the morning, for the Lord hears your grumblings, which you grumble against him. And what are we? Your grumblings are not against us, but against the Lord. It is an amazing story that God would provide for his people this food that they would describe as manna, that he was going to make it rain bread. Did you pick up on some of the things that, that Moses said, that they were going to be have this every day. Later on in the chapter, in chapter 16 and verse number 31, the Bible says, the house of Israel named it manna, and it was like coriander seed, white, and its taste was like wafers with honey. That sounds pretty good. And that's what they were going to be able to eat every day for a span of 40 years. In verse 5, as we read, that God told them on the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather it daily. So he's given them instructions about how they were to, to handle this manna. On the sixth day, you make sure you bring in extra because the seventh day is the a day of rest. It's the Sabbath day. And so this is what they were supposed to do. But did you pick up on something else? He also talked to them about the fact that he was going to give them meat to eat in verse number 8. So he wasn't just going to give them manna. Yes, he gave them manna, but look at verse number 11. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, I have heard the grumblings of the sons of Israel speak to them saying, at twilight you shall eat meat and in the morning you shall be filled with bread and you shall know that I am the Lord your God. So it came about at evening that the quails came up and covered the camp and in the morning there were layer of dew around the camp. When the layer of dew evaporated, behold, on the surface of the wilderness, there was a fine flake-like thing, fine as a frost on the ground. Can you imagine if you were there and you wake up, and every day you wake up and breakfast is served? It's not room service, it's tent service, okay? Every morning you wake up and breakfast is served. But it got it even better. In the evening time, you wouldn't have to worry about where you're going to eat in the evening time because God said, I'm going to give you meat to eat in the evening time. Think about how amazing this miracle really is. This was not just for one day or for one week or for one month or for one year. God did this every day, except the Sabbath, he did this every day for a span of 40 years. And when you think about the fact that we're talking about one to maybe two million people every day, God is doing this. That shows how awesome our God really is. This story of manna is showing certainly the power of God. And what God wanted his people to see is that, listen, I'm going to provide for you. Yeah, you're complaining against me. And what's interesting, when you think about what the Israelites were doing as God provided manna for them from heaven, they were people who often complained. Did you pick up in Exodus chapter 16 and verse number 2? It said that the people grumbled. In verse number 7, we see that they were grumbling again, or they had grumbled again. In verse number 8, he talks about the grumbling. In verse number 9, in verse number 12, about eight times in this passage, he speaks to the fact that they were complaining and grumbling despite all that God had done for them. And yet God said, I'm still going to provide for you exactly what you need. And they would eat the same breakfast for 40 years. They'd eat the same breakfast for 40 years. In Exodus chapter 16 and verse number 35, we see how long this would last. In Exodus 16 and verse number 35, the Bible says, the sons of Israel ate the manna 40 years until they came to an inhabited land. They ate the manna until they came to the border of the land of Canaan. So every day for a span of 40 years, God provided for them. He gave them exactly 
what they needed. So why would he do all of this? What was the purpose behind all of this? What was God's reasoning? Well, he helps us to see in Exodus chapter 16 that his people needed to learn a lesson. Number one, they complained too much. They were always grumbling. There was always something wrong to find. He just delivered them out of Egyptian bondage. They were they have been there for centuries, and a couple of days after they're delivered, what are they doing? They're finding something to complain about. They're grumbling. So number one, he's trying to, I think, help them to see, stop your complaining. You're complaining too much. And number two, they needed to learn obedience. In Exodus chapter 16 and verse number four, he said, behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day that I may test them. Are they really going to listen to me? You, you, t- you eat as much manna as you want and just take what it is that you want, but don't leave any extra there because if you do, it's going to turn into worm food. And so he was testing them to make sure that they would truly listen to him. They needed ultimately to trust in his word in Deuteronomy chapter 8, and I want you to notice in verse number 1, Deuteronomy chapter 8, and I want you to notice in verse number 1 what the Bible says here. In Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse number 1, All the commandments that I am commanding you today, you shall be careful to do, that you may live in all the commandments of the land which the Lord swore to give to your forefathers. You shall remember all the way which the Lord your God has led you in the wilderness these 40 years, that he might humble you, testing you, to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. He humbled you and let you be hungry. And fed you with manna which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you understand that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. God gave them this new food, this meal for 40 years so that they would trust in him, that they would believe his word, and that they would truly rely upon him. And yet the strange thing through all of this is that in the process of time, they're getting everything they could ever need. You know what happened in the process of time? They began to complain about the manna. God had given them exactly what they needed to live. He was giving them life. He was giving them bread from heaven. Yet in the process of time, they would begin to complain. In Numbers chapter 11, when look over in Numbers chapter 11, what's interesting here, in Numbers chapter 11, you get to see the mindset of the people in Numbers chapter 11. Beginning in verse number 5, in Numbers chapter 11, in verse number 5, the Bible says the Israelites were saying, We remember the fish which we used to eat free in Egypt, the cucumbers, and the melons, and the leeks, and the onions, and the garlic. But now our appetite is gone. There is nothing at all to look at except this manna. You ever do that when you're at the house? Like I open the refrigerator. I already know there's nothing in it, but I look to see maybe there's something else in it. Or you look and you say, I already know what you have. They got so used to eating the manna, now they're complaining about this. This is a miracle. Every day, for 40 years, God is performing a miracle. They are tasting. They are seeing. They are experiencing. And yet they said, we're tired of this manna. Come on, God, give us something a little bit different. Is this the best that you can do? We're tired of looking at this. Our appetite is gone. There's nothing at all to look at except this manna. What a shame that God had blessed them so richly, and yet they were still complaining. They forgot everything that God had done. And it wasn't that they just complained and whined and lacked trust in God. They had hostility seemingly toward God. Why would you ever say something like that to God? He is blessing you every day with this manna. So how in the world could they find it within themselves to actually say this to God? I'm tired of looking at this food. Could you please give us something else? And maybe there was something more, the idea of hostility and an unwillingness to truly truly submit to God. They complained about food. They complained about water in Exodus chapter 17. They made demands to God. Uh, they, they demanded God provide for them and, and give them everything that they needed. And certainly God would do that. But there's just a lack of respect and appreciation of the great blessings that God had already given them. In Exodus chapter 17, the next chapter over, then all the congregation of the sons of Israel journeyed by stages from the wilderness of sin according to the command of the Lord and kept camped at Rephidim, and there was no water for the people to drink. 
drink. Therefore the people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water. And they grumbled against Moses and said, Why now have you brought us up from Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? They just didn't get it. A miracle for 40 years. And they resort back to a lack of appreciation. Manna every day. They forgot what God had done for them. The manna, the quail, the water. Now, how does this apply to us at all? I think there's great application for us. The fact that God gave them manna in the wilderness. He sent bread down from heaven. And brothers and sisters, we can say that God has provided manna for us. We read, Kevin led us in our Bible reading in John chapter 6. And I want you to turn over in John chapter 6. We're looking at types and antitypes in our Bible class on Wednesdays. And what we find here is a type antitype in John chapter 6. As Jesus would make it very clear that he is a true bread from heaven. In John chapter 6, we see some amazing events taking place where Jesus performed a miracle. It was an amazing miracle. I know all miracles are amazing, but just thinking about this miracle is so powerful where Jesus had thousands of people listening to him. And Jesus recognized that the people were hungry. In John chapter 6 and verse 5, it says, Therefore Jesus, lifting up his eyes and seeing that a large crowd was coming to them, said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these may eat? This he was saying to test them for to test him for he himself knew what he was intending to do philip answered 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them for everyone to receive a little one of his disciples andrew simon peter's brother said to him there's a lad here who has five barley loaves and two fish but what are these for so many people Jesus said, have the people sit down now there was much grass in the place so the men sat down and number In number about 5,000. Now listen to this. Jesus then took the loaves, and having given thanks, he distributed to those who were seated. Likewise, also of the fish, as much as they wanted. How does that work? He's feeding all of these people, thousands of people, and they're able to eat as much as they wanted. In verse 12, when they were filled, he said to his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments so that nothing will be lost. So they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves which were left over by those who had eaten. Therefore, when the people saw the sign which he had performed, they said, This is truly the prophet who is to come into the world. Jesus performed this amazing miracle. What a powerful miracle to feed thousands upon thousands of individuals. And yet he wanted them to see, I have something far greater I can do for you. I can fill your stomach with food, with bread and with fish, but I have something far greater that I want to give to you. What I want to truly give to you is eternal life. I'm the source of eternal life, and I'm the one that can truly give you what it is that you need. The Jews at this time were going to try to make him king, and Jesus would escape and and go to the other side. And later on in the story, we find in verse number 25, when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered them and said, truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not do the work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life. He's using an ellipsis here, not merely this, but also this, which the Son of Man will give to you, for on him the Father God has set his seal. Therefore they said to him, What shall we do, so that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, What then do you do for a sign, so that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Where he had already performed a miracle. He just fed them. They tasted the miracle. They saw, they experienced the sign. And he would say in verse 31, or they said in verse 31, our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread out of heaven to eat. That's what we just read. Now watch what Jesus is going to say here. Jesus then said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it is not Moses who has given you the true bread out of heaven, but it is my father who gives you the true bread out of heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, always give us this bread. It sounds so much like the conversation with the woman at the well, doesn't it? Give me this water so I'll never be thirsty. Now they're saying, give me this bread so that we can have all of this. And Jesus said in verse 35 to them, I am the bread of life. You see what he's helping them to see? I'm exactly what you need. 
I'm the one that can give you eternal life. Yeah, Moses, in, in the Old Testament, that miracle occurred, and that was an amazing miracle, but I brought you something far better, something more than just satisfying your physical needs. I can give you everything that you truly need. And Jesus said to him, I am the, said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. But I say to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. All that the Father gives, gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Jesus made it very clear, I am the true bread of life. I am the bread of life. I am exactly what it is that you need. In verse number 49, Jesus said, Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread which comes down out of heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread also which I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. He's not talking about literally eating in his flesh, but talking about who he is in this relationship and the words that he came to give. He wanted them to see that he is indeed the true bread of life, that he came down from heaven to set men free and to give us eternity. And those who have a relationship with him will live forever. He is the one that has given us life-giving words. And brothers and sisters, when you think about that, we should be amazed about that. I'm amazed with the manna, the fact that God would, for 40 years, make it rain bread every day six days a week. The quail would be there in the evening time. That's pretty amazing. But you know what else is amazing? Is the fact that Jesus would leave heaven for you and for me. That's exactly what he did. And that's what he wanted the people to see. I have something far greater that I can give to you. Something that you really need. I have words of eternal life and you need to believe in me. You need to believe that I am indeed the son of the living God. We should be amazed that God sent his son to die on the cross for our sins. God has made provision for us. God has given us the protection that we need through his son and allowed us to enter into presence with him because of what Jesus has done, this fellowship, this relationship that we have with him. The Israelites saw God's grace in the wilderness, and we have been able to witness the grace of God by learning about what Jesus has done for us on the old rugged cross. And that, my friend, is truly amazing. And that is something that we truly need to appreciate, that God has given us manna when he gave us his son to die for us. He is the true bread of life, and he is the one that we need to believe, and he is the one that we need to follow. He is the one that we need to trust. But there are a couple of questions that we need to consider. And one question that I want us to consider this morning is this. God has provided manna for us. He sent his son, Jesus, the bread of life from heaven. He sent his son so that we might be redeemed from our sins. He sent his son so that we could have eternal life. But a couple of questions for us is this. One is how much do we appreciate what God has given us? The manna that God gave the Israelites in the Old Testament, it was amazing. And I'm sure the first day, the first week, the first month, maybe the first year, maybe the first decade, it never got old. But in the process of time, did you see, remember their attitude in Numbers 11? They said, this is all we have. We just have manna. We don't have anything else to eat, just this manna. Well, God was giving them a miracle every day. And maybe something for us to think about is this. How much do we appreciate what God has given us? We talk about Jesus who came and lived on earth. We talk about Jesus who came and died on the cross for our sins. And it was so easy for the Israelites to take for granted the manna that God had given them. Brothers and sisters, a question for us to think about is are we taking for granted the relationship that we have with Jesus? Are we taking for granted what God has given to us? He gave us his son. He gave us his son to die on the old rugged cross. We cannot allow that to happen. And yet, God, and yet that can happen so quickly, just as it did in the Old Testament. God has given us a gift. When you really think about this, a gift that rust and moth cannot destroy, salvation, eternity, and heaven. He's given us something so great that nothing can ever compare to it. But a question we need to think about is, how much do we truly appreciate the gift that God has given us? The Israelites, for a time, they appreciated what God had given them. But in the process of time, they began to take that for granted. My friend, we cannot allow that to happen. A second question we need to think about is, are we going to trust in the manna that God has given us? Jesus came down from heaven. He said, I want you to believe. You need to believe in me. 
I am the bread of life. But are we going to truly trust what it is that God says, what it is that Jesus says? Are we fully trusting in the Lord as we should? Do we believe that what he's given us and done for us on the cross is sufficient? He died for our sins. He loved us so much that he was willing to sacrifice his life. And maybe a bigger question with this thought is this, will we remain with him forever? What more can God do to demonstrate his love for you and for me? He sent his son to die on the cross. Are we going to remain with him forever? What God wanted from his people then is what he wants from us. What did he want from the Israelites? Well, number one, he wanted obedience. Would they really listen to his words? He wanted gratitude. I think we can say that. He wanted thanks and glory and praise, and he wanted his people to trust him. He never failed Israel, and he will never fail us. He has given us manna to eat. He has given us eternal life. He has given us the greatest thing that he ever could, his son, Jesus Christ. And if you are a child of God, I want you to really think about this this morning. As Christians, and so many of us in this audience are Christians. If you're not a Christian, I want to encourage you to become one. But as Christians, we have the greatest relationship one could ever have. A, a relationship with the Father, a relationship with the Son, the relationship with the Holy Spirit. We have salvation. We have hope of eternal life. And we have certainly tasted and experienced what it means to be satisfied in Christ through his mercy, through his grace, through his forgiveness, through his love. And that, my friend, is something that we should never forget. The Israelites failed to consider the mercy and grace of God. They failed to appreciate what was right in front of them every morning. We cannot allow that to happen when it comes to our relationship with Jesus Christ. So as we march toward our promised land, let's remember the blessings that Jesus has truly given to us. He's given us eternal life, and he's given us a relationship with him and with the Father. And the question for all of us is, how are we going to respond to all that he has given to us with grumbling or with giving him the glory that he truly deserves? God performed an amazing miracle in the Old Testament, the miracle of making it rain bread with manna. And in the New Testament, God sent his son to die on the cross and raised his son from the grave on the first day of the week to provide for us the very thing that we need, eternal life. Let's make sure that we hold on to that. And if we don't have eternal life in Jesus Christ, then I want to conclude with these words this morning. There were some who, after heard the words of Jesus in John chapter 6 and verse 66, they said, as a result of this, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. So Jesus said to the twelve, you do not want to go away also, do you? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have words of eternal life. We have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. That's what God desires for all men to believe that, he, that his son Jesus is the Holy One of God, that indeed he has the words of eternal life, and to follow and to obey the one that can truly give you what it is that you need. Not bread that's only going to sustain you for a short amount of time, but forgiveness of sins and a relationship with Jesus Christ. Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of the living God? Will you confess your faith that you believe that he is the Son of God? Will you be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins? And if you are a Christian, please do not forget, and this applies to me as well, verse number 68. Simon Peter answered, said, Lord, to whom shall we go? If we ever decide to leave Jesus, where are we going to go? Now, we can decide to no longer walk with him if we choose, but to what end? He is the source of eternal life. He is the one that has delivered us from our sins. And yet if we decide to leave him, to say, I'm no longer going to listen to you, I'm no longer going to abide in your word and follow your teaching, where shall we go? We will never find the satisfaction. We'll never find what it is that we think we may find if we ever decide to leave him. He is the source of eternal life. 
Let's make sure we hold on to what we have. If you're subject to the invitation, come now as we stand and as we sing. Hello.